Hello. Life in London in 1910 was changing rapidly. Increasingly, there were motor cars on the streets, Blerio had flown the channel, and a few people even had telephones. The women's suffrage movement was gaining strength, and the Labour Party had been founded in 1900, but Britain had its empire and still ruled much of the world, and the capital's older citizens would still have recognised it as the place where they grew up. In a few short years, however, the First World War, the Soviet Revolution and the growing strength and influence of the USA would change Britain's economic, social and cultural landscape forever. Music was also changing. In 1904, the country's first self-governing orchestra, the London Symphony Orchestra, was founded, and by 1908, the Palace Theatre Orchestra had started making gramophone records, but much was still as it had been during Victorian times. Some time ago, I found a copy of the 1910 issue of Rudolf Kart's musical directory Alm Annual and Al Almanac in a second-hand bookshop, and within its 496 pages were insights into a London music scene which would soon become unrecognisable. 34 pages were devoted to London's professional instrumentalists, arranged alphabetically and by instrument, and among them were the names and addresses of 81 horn players. I embarked on a systematic attempt to find out who these people were, what they did, and I should like to share some of my findings and some of their stories with you. How the editors collected the names is not known, but they, were clearly, they clearly intended their list to be the place to go for those needing to book players. Although most of the performers listed were professionals, the directory also includes a small handful who mostly made their living in other ways and were unlikely to have been included unless they had asked. Three were piano tuners. Anthony Reinders was mainly a pianist. James South was an oil and colour man and Handel Knott worked in insurance. Not every working horn player was listed, and the most notable absentee was the German Adolf Borsdorf, the greatest London horn player of the day. Maybe he felt he had all the work he could cope with, or maybe he was ahead of his time, as he was the only horn player in 1910 to own a telephone. Others were missing from the list too. The Musicians' Union had a 26-strong list of horn-playing members in 1910, but only five of them had directory listings. The most famous section of the day, so supreme that they were nicknamed God's Own Quartet, played for the London Symphony Orchestra, and all but Borsdorf, the first horn, had directory entries. On second horn was Henri van der Meerschen, a Belgian who studied at the Paris Conservatoire, while the third and fourth parts were played by two Englishmen, Thomas Busby and Alfred Edwin Brain. Both learned to play in the British Army, Busby and the Grenadier Guards, and Brain in the 18th Regiment of Foot. Both had fathers who were military men, though while Busby's was probably the best army drummer of his day, Brain's father, William, was only an amateur singer. From this limited picture, one might hazard a guess that most horn players in London would be ex-army, or who would have fathers who were musicians, or possibly both, and that the rest of the profession might be bulked up by immigrant musicians. That guess would be largely correct. The one who bucked the trend was Rosabel Watson, who played the horn, violin and double bass, ran a women's orchestra and a hostel for female music students and went on to become musical director for the Shakespeare Company. Of the rest, the 80 men in the directory, 10 were foreign nationals and there were five who mainly supported themselves by working elsewhere. Curiously, there were still listings for Adam Stock, who died in 1905, Alfred Rawlings, who died in 1907, and George Bowes, who died in 1909. This leaves 62 British men who played professionally in London in 1910, and of these, 49, so nearly 79%, had belonged to army regiments. Of the remaining 11, four had fathers in the business, three had trained at the Royal Academy of Music, three more had trained at the Royal College of Music, and three had no apparent previous connections to music.
The directory had been listing players since the 1870s, and by reference to older issues, I now have just enough data to make comparisons with previous years, though the figures are a little rough and ready, not least because there are a few players who have not yet traced, or where I can't be sure that they played professionally. But, if we just compare the numbers of British-born professionals who were army trained, the figures for a decade earlier are 74.5% out of a total of 59 players, and in 1891, 80% of 40 players. The figures for 1881 come out rather differently, with just 58% of players being army trained. I'm not sure why this is, but there may be several reasons, some musical, though others may be to do with the small size of the sample. Only 36 players took listings in 1881, although I'm sure that there were many more horn players in London at the time. The small number of players who trained at either the Royal Academy of Music or the Royal College of Music might at first sight seem surprising, though for much of the 19th century, the management at the Academy had shown little interest in training brass players. While there was an orchestra which rehearsed regularly, the brass were usually brought in from outside. When the Royal College of Music was founded in 1882, it had purposely awarded scholarships to wind and brass players so that they could develop their own, and while these started to filter into the profession, their contribution was still marginal and in stark contrast to the situation in Paris. The 1910 issue of the Honneur on Onuaire Musicale, which, like the musical directory, listed performers by instrument, showed a different picture. There, 34 of the 61 players listed trained at the Paris Conservatoire, meaning that over 50% of Paris's horn players were trained by just two teachers, Jean Maure and François Bremond. Even though French and English professionals both preferred narrow-bore Perrinet-style vowels, apparent Perrinet vowels and rowel style styled instruments with detachable crooks over the wider bore fixed lead pipe a rotary valve instruments popular in Germany and the USA, the fact that the Parisian horn scene was so dominated by the Conservatoire, while London's players mostly learned in a more fragmented way, perhaps indicates that players had a different mindset and a different sense of style. Maybe this was one reason why the characteristic horn tone of London and Paris was so very different in the interwar years. Turning to the military players in London, one might ask where they trained. There was certainly no formal training centre for young players. While the army's Nella Hall opened in 1857, and while it had instrumental teachers, it was intended first and foremost as a school for teaching bandmasters and not instrumentalists. There is evidence that was an annual competition, but its influence seems to have been limited. Again, the French were a step ahead. From 1836 to 1856, would-be army valve horn players could study at the Gymnase Musicale Militaire with Donatien Urbain, one of the players from the Paris Opera, or with Pierre-Joseph Meyfray, valve horn player at the Conservatoire from 1833 until 1864. When the Gymnase closed, the military players were sent off to the Conservatoire. And although it reverted to teaching only the natural horn after Mayford's death, it continued to play an important role in bandsman's training. And a newspaper report of the Conservatoire's 1906 Concours remarked on the brilliant colours of the military uniforms worn by some of the competitors. In England, where soldiers joined up at ages as young as 13, they would have learned from their bandmaster and picked up what they could from their fellow performers. Accounts of learning are virtually non-existent, though photographs survive showing small boys in uniform holding their instruments proudly. In France, students had a magnificent series of tutors to learn from, yet there was little for British boys to study. A grand method for the French horn, published in 1880 by Lafleur, cobbled together studies by Mayfred, Gaillet and Dopa, and would have given learners something to practice, but there was little in it that would have been approachable for youngsters or very much used to them. And it was not until 1910 that Hawkes published Otto Lange's Practical Tutor for the French horn, though that was far too late for our 1910 cohort. 
It seems that there was an unofficial system of promotion within the army. While boys joined regiments across the country, some seemed to have been headhunted, and many of the best ended up in the Coldstream, Grenadier, Scots and Irish Guards bands, the two bands of the Lifeguards or the band of the Royal Artillery. 29 of the 49 Army horn players in the 1910 Directory had served in those regiments. As they were permanently based in London, and as most of the bandsmen lived in their own homes rather than in barracks, and were thus already part of the community, they would have been well placed to build their contact before they left the army. Those who had joined up at 13 would normally have stayed in the army for 21 years and would have qualified for their pension when they were just 34. William Langford, for example, took his pension of 10 pence a day for life in 1898 after 21 years service, so that's five shillings and six pence per week. Thomas Busby's brother Walter, who in 1899 worked as a guard at Waterloo Station, earned 15 shillings per week at a time when the average UK wave, wage was 25 shillings. So, seen in comparison with contemporary norms, it wasn't much, but it offered protection for those aiming to make a career in the unreliable world of music. Indeed, such a safety net would have allowed ex-bandsmen to contemplate a career too risky for most others, and may be a factor which helps it to explain the tiny number of outsiders in the musician's world. Those undertaking the better type of orchestral concert at the time are said to have received a fee of a guinea, 21 shillings, so it was possible to earn a living if you were good enough, but none of them got very rich through horn playing. Adolf Borsdorf left £818 in his will, but that was far beyond what most could aspire to. Alfred Rawlins, for example, left £90, which was perhaps more typical. Many of those joining the army as boys had been destined for an army life from an even younger age. Take William Lightman, for example, the illegitimate son of Anne Lightman. He was born in Shoreditch Workhouse and transferred to Marylebone Workhouse when he was six years old. His mother died when he was nine. He and his sister were then separated and William was sent to the Southall Poor Law School, where he was housed and educated. Many of these schools had a band which would play an important part in school life, and being part of the band gave the boys a training which enabled them to be taken on by a regiment. Aged 13, William became a boy soldier with the 2nd Regiment of Foot, and must have become a fine player as he made a successful transition to the civilian musical profession. By his 50s, he was playing at the Palace Theatre and may well be one of the performers on recordings that the orchestra made from around 1908. Another was Harry Whittle. Aged three, he and his sister were admitted to the Strand Union Workhouse in Edmonton. His sister was sent out to be a servant, but the school had a band which Harry must have joined, and aged 15 and a half, he attested for the Royal Munster Fusiliers. Life at the school was certainly not a picnic. On the day he joined the army, Harry was four foot ten and a half inches tall, weighed just 75 pounds and had a 26 and a half inch chest. For comparison, my son was that weight when he was 11 and that age, when he, that height when he was 12. Since the 18th century, foreign players had performed regularly in London, and while some just passed through, many stayed. In 1910, the finest of these was Borsdorf, though, as we have seen, he was omitted from the directory. Of the ten who were listed, the most distinguished was his colleague Van der Meersen. Closely followed by Willem Breithoff, who Henry Wood had brought over to play first horn in the Queen's Hall Orchestra after Borsdorf defected to the LSO. He, is, he had served as first horn in Amsterdam's Concertgebouw Orchestra under Mengelberg and came, out with a, and came with a ringing endorsement from Richard Strauss, but somehow it did not work out. And while he played first horn in the Beecham Symphony Orchestra in 1912, he returned to Amsterdam during the war. Others tended to work at a slightly lower level. 
Another Dutch player, Marianus Langerak, worked with the Buxton Gardens Band and at the, bump, and at the Bath Pump Room, while the third, Jacobus Gerhardt, is only known from his membership of the London County Council Band, which played in the city's parks during the summer. The Italian, Michelangelo Gudella, was a member of the excellent orchestra at the Empire Theatre, Leicester Square, though one of the more colourful players from the directory was his fellow countryman Francesco Rabotini, who, as a boy, had played the bugle in Garibaldi's army. He played for Mascani at Covent Garden and was first horn at the Pier Pavilion Hastings, but he really wanted to be a band leader and advertised himself as the great Rabatini with his classical comedy and ragtime band. He might have become a star, but the war got in the way, and after it finished, he worked as a horn player at the Bath Pump Room and took a summer season at Scarborough. One of the more left field careers was that of the German Gustav Schulze. He played in various theatre orchestras from around 1891, but in 1914 he emigrated to Western Australia where he worked as a farmhand. In 1919 he was jailed for three months for stealing a saddle, and aged 84, 84, he was gored to death by a bull on a farm in the outback. A few British players went overseas to develop their careers. The most famous was Alf Brain Jr., the son of the LSO's fourth horn. He followed Breithoff in the Queen's Hall Orchestra and went on to become a leading Hollywood studio player. While, while Oscar Borsdorf, the son of Adolf and third horn in the Queen's Hall Orchestra, went on to a successful career as a conductor on Broadway. Another was Maurice Guttridge, Born in Manhattan, but the son of the Queen's Hall Orchestra Sheffield-born trombonist Thomas Guttridge. He studied at the Royal Academy of Music and then emigrated to Australia, where his career was very different from Schultz's. He claimed to be the only true purveyor of jazz in Australia and was one of the coolest cats of the Roaring Twenties. Though behind the scenes, his life was a tragic story of broken marriage and bankruptcy. Many of the horn players from 1910 fought in the war and not all returned. Among them was Cecil Ivanhoe Henderson, the son of Queen's Hall and LSO timpanist Charles Henderson. Cecil was killed in action at the Battle of Cumbrae in November 1917. Finally, let me introduce a further horn playing subset, the four men born in India who were a part of the 1910 club. Three were the sons of serving soldiers, though one, George Everett, was the son of a station master on the East India Railway. I'll finish, however, with one of my favourites, John Reagan, who was born in the Calcutta suburb of Dum Dum. His father was a member of the Wiltshire Regiment and John joined them when he was 14. He was hardly a model soldier and he was punished variously for improper conduct in the barracks, gambling in the workhouse, neglecting to bring his march cards on church parade and highly irregular conduct. He transferred to the Royal Munster Volunteers, where things didn't go much better, and he was punished after failing to make it back to camp till morning after a night on the tiles in Newcastle. But he made good and became a reformed character when he served with the band of the Coldstream Guards, finishing his career as a sergeant in the Sussex Militia. There's so many more stories I could tell, but that's all I've got time for today. So it only remains for me to say thank you very much for listening.